Hello Year 10 and welcome back to our second lesson of distance learning. So hopefully you've all seen and watched and engaged in by writing the notes the previous lesson on plant adaptations. Hopefully I won't have so many hiccups this time um, and this will upload properly and you will get the most out of it. Now today we are looking at six mark questions and some shorter answers as well. The way you're really going to get the most out of this lesson is if you really do try to pause the video and try the questions out for yourself rather than just skipping straight to the answers. Um, I know it feels a bit tedious sometimes just to, to be doing some questions. We won't be doing this all the time. It was part of the, the lessons um, before um, you know we came off school. So we do need to have a look at some six markers and some other questions. So we're looking at... Uh, Title for our book, How Can Animal and Plant Adaptations Help Their Survival? So, like I said, we're going to look at some questions. Next lesson, so the last lesson for this week, we are going to look at quadrat sampling. So we will have a look at a required practical there and a bit of uh, uh, kind of practical skills. OK, so hopefully we've written our title now. How can animal and plant adaptations help their survival? Okay, so this is our first six marker, okay. Now it says, describe how animals and plants, so we've got to do examples of both, are adapted to, to survive in dry conditions such as deserts. For each adaptation that you give, describe how the adaptation helps the animal or plant to survive in dry conditions. Now this is one where we could be tricked into thinking, really easy question. I know how to answer this, I've got loads of ideas. Now it's about how they're adapted to dry conditions. So you don't want to be talking about things like camouflage, for example, because that's an adaptation to, you know, the conditions of blending in, not being seen by predators, that kind of thing. But we're just looking at adaptations for the fact that they're in a dry environment, okay? So I'm not going to have this running for six minutes because I think it's a bit of a waste of time. Um, but you can pause it, give yourself six minutes. You can do it as bullet points. I would suggest doing three points for animals and three points for plants. If you're finding plants a bit trickier, try and go for four points for animals and two points for plants. OK, so we're going to go on to pause now and give yourself that six minutes to try the question. Okay, hopefully you did what I said and you did pause it and you have given yourself a go to try and do that six marker. This uh, mark scheme goes over two pages, okay? So we need our green pens in our hands now and we're gonna look at the features that they've suggested and this isn't an exclusive list because there's so many different animals that you could think of but here are some examples of what we could have said about animals and remember we're trying to get three possibly four points out of our anim animal uh, response here so we could have talked about decrease in um Oh, OK. OK, so we've got de decrease in the area from which they sweat so that they uh, don't sweat. We could talk about um, a camel and the hump with fat um, that they then it doesn't actually in, uh, insulate them, but they just store it on the top. So they've got it as their their fat store without being an insulation store. Long eyelashes to keep the wind out of uh, uh, and the sand out of their eyes. They could be nocturnal. Um, so they stay out of the sun during the day and they would um, eat food at night time, come out at night um, to avoid the heat of the day. Um, it could be that you talk about, and we talked about it a couple of lessons ago, the change in surface area to volume ratio. So we tend to find that animals that live in the hotter environments have a large surface area to volume ratio, therefore that you see like there, we saw the fennec fox with the big tail, the big ears, uh, they can lose a lot more heat to the environment. Now I know that kind of um, conflicts what we said about decreased surface area for sweating, um, but for heat loss, it's really, really beneficial to have that large surface area compared to the volume ratio. Uh, we've also got changes to the thickness of the insulating coat, so quite fine fur, um, Eva, 
even uh, losing the fur in, in the hotter times of the year. Um, less body fat, so less of an insulating layer. Um, and we've got the wide feet to spread um, spread the weight. This is talking about camels again. Now it's not really, uh, I kind of I kind of got a conflicting view on this really, I think, because yes, okay, dry environment, they're on the sand, they want to spread out that um, weight, but it's not really necessarily for the temperature of a dry environment. It's just that because they're in a dry environment, they're on the sand, okay? So you can kind of see where I'm coming from, hopefully. So that's our kind of features of animals. And remember, we've got our green pen out. We're adding an extra detail here or there if we need to. Um, let's have a look at features of plants. If you still need a bit more time on animals, pause now. Okay, here we are looking at um, features of the plants. We've got reduced surface area. We've got the leaves of spikes. We talked about that in um, last lesson when we said um, that uh, the spines of a cactus actually have a very small surface area, but it's enough to take in all of the light they need for photosynthesis. Also, because they're spikes, it stops them being eaten. They've got less water loss through the stomata because there's less of them. Loss of water, we can call that transpiration as well, or evaporation, or even evapotranspiration. They've got these widespread, extensive roots, so as soon as it does rain, they can collect as much water as possible. They've got maybe um, deep roots that go right down into the ground and collect water from lower down in the ground. And they've got this fleshy, thick stem storing lots of water with that waxy cuticle um, surrounding it to avoid water loss. Um, I think I've covered all the points, even in the extra information um, as I talked through it. Oh, that's my other computer trying to do something. Sorry about that. Okay, let's have a look. If you, Like I said, if you need um, extra time, the time to pause is now. Okay, so here is just a reminder. I feel like we've been talking a lot about these guard stels and stomata. Um, like I said before, we've talked about them in B1 and in B4, both of those topics taught in Year 9. Okay, bit of a cut out there. Someone tried to FaceTime me and it, it stopped the video. So I'm back here now talking about stomata. Um, so we talked about how in B1 and B4, we put the nail varnish um, on the underside of the leaf. When we peeled that off, we were able to see um, the guard cells, okay? And we've got one guard cell here, one guard cell here, and they work in pairs to control whether this stomata, this is an open space, is open or closed. And the purpose of the stomata is gas exchange, to allow carbon dioxide into the leaf by diffusion, to allow oxygen out of the leaf by diffusion from high concentration to low concentration. The purpose of the stomata is not about water control. Because you've got this hole in the leaf, you're gonna have some water loss, okay? It's just what's gonna happen. Okay, but that's not why the stomata are there. It's just an unfortunate byproduct of the fact that they are there, um, is that water is lost. Okay, water certainly never goes in the stomata, and that is a common misconception. People can tell you that uh, water goes in at the roots, and then they start talking about water going in the stomata as well, and that is definitely not the case, okay? So I thought I'd bring this in just to remind ourselves, here we've got a cross section of the leaf, here are the stomata at the bottom with the guard cells and the lower epidermis, here we've got a vein with our um, xylem and phloem, here are those palisade cells, doing the photosynthesis and we've got our waxy cuticle on the top here. So just put that in just to kind of remind us really about stomata, where they are. We're talking about them a lot. Wanted to make sure that we really fully understand what those are all about. Okay, now we're on to talking about these things called extremophiles, okay? We do need to write a note from this page, please. So, some organisms live in environments that are very extreme. Extremophiles may be tolerant to, that means can cope with, high levels of salt, high temperatures or high pressures. Okay, I'm going to show you some examples in a second. I'll just give you a minute to write that down because we do need... Um, a note in our books, even if we just go for the second sentence only, starting at the word extremophiles.
Okay, so the extremophiles may be tolerant, that means they can cope with high levels of salt, high temperatures or high pressures. Let's move on. If you need to pause because uh, you're still writing, do so now. Okay, here's an example of an extremophile. This is the anglerfish, okay? You may be familiar with this from Finding Nemo and it's got this bioluminescent lure just here, that's this bit here, which kind of lures in um, the prey, helps them to see where they're going, see the prey, and then they can pounce on the prey. And these live really, really far underneath the, the uh, you know, deep in the water. And the pressure of the water pushing on the fish is so extreme that the internal pressure of the fish has to push out at the same um, force with the same force so if you actually took one of these angler fish and brought it up to the surface of the water it would actually explode because there's so much pressure inside to cope with the pressure that's pushed on them on the outside so they really only can live at those really deep depths it's just quite an interesting one that i quite like to talk about okay no need to write any notes there unless you want to in which case you can pause now so we've got an exam question again which term describes organisms that can tolerate very hot or very cold places? We've got an environmental species, an extremophile species, or an indicator species. It is an extremophile species. Figure one shows photographs of an Adelie penguin and a chinstrap penguin. Adelie penguins and chinstrap penguins live in the uh, Antarctic at temperatures below zero degrees C. Adelie penguins spend most of their time on the ice around the uh, Antarctic. Chinstrap penguins live mainly in the sea around the ice. Since 1965, the number of Adelie penguins has decreased by 6 million. So we've got some information there. We might want to flip back to that in a minute just to kind of reassure ourselves when we're doing our questions. So we've now got figure two shows changes in the ice around the Antarctic over the past 50 years. Use information from figure two to explain why the number of Adelie penguins has decreased since 1965. And it's a two marker, this one. Okay, so let's go back. Adelie penguins have decreased in this time. Now, Adelie penguins spend most of their time on the ice. So if we look at the area of ice in 1965, the area of ice in 2015, that area has rapidly decreased. So we can say, that there is a decrease in the amount of ice and so therefore they've had a loss of habitat or they've got less area to live in. Okay, so we're going to get two marks out of this. Okay, I know I'm talking you through this one. I don't want to keep pausing. I will pause on the longer answer questions. Suggest so what's happened to the number of chinstrap penguins since 1965. Draw a ring around your answer. Okay, so what's happened to the number of chinstrap penguins? Let's go back to our information. Chinstrap penguins live mainly in the sea. So I'm going to go with they've increased because, and I know it sounds silly because the sea is huge, but they have a larger area of sea to live in. Let's have a look at the mark scheme. So we had extremophile species. We had less ice, therefore less habitat. Good. Um, and you could have said increases as more sea to live in, less competition for food, that's a good one. Or you could have said decrease because there's less space to lay eggs or a predator is more likely to eat them. So you could have gone for increase or decrease. I went for increase, um, but there are other options there as well. Okay, if you do need to have an extra bit of green pen time on there, then pause now. And this is our final question for today's lesson. The photograph shows a lionfish. Lionfish are normally found in the Pacific Ocean. Um, in 1992, six lionfish escaped from an aquarium into the Atlantic Ocean. Now there are thousands of lionfish in the Atlantic Ocean. Numbers of the native Atlantic fish have gone down because the lionfish have eaten many native Atlantic fish suggest explanations for the large increase of lionfish in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, have a think. 
It's quite interesting actually because lionfish are poisonous. So if you touch any of those bits that are sticking out, is they are poisonous. But they are kind of culled from areas because they have such a devastating effect that they um, can actually be eaten. You can eat lionfish. So if you go uh, maybe places in the Caribbean, then you can actually eat lionfish. But I am distracting you from the question, so I shall let you concentrate for a minute. Suggest explanations for the large increase in the number of lionfish in the Atlantic Ocean. I think we're going to be talking about competition in this question. Okay, you do have three minutes to answer this because it's a three marker. If you need extra time, then pause the video now. Okay, let's have a look. So there are few or no predators of the lionfish. That's the reason why their numbers could be going up. The spines are protected, um, protect the lionfish from being eaten. Warning colorations and they're poisonous. I mentioned that one. Um, it could be that there's no or fewer disease organisms so they're, they're kind of quite tough and they don't get um, affected by things so we've got one mark there predators or prey in the atlantic do not recognize the lionfish or they're not being fished by humans so it could be that the predator or prey don't recognize it so they're not fearful and therefore they're um, being eaten um, or attacked um, and humans might not be that interested it's kind of a new thing really that humans have been fishing them um, but at that time, maybe they weren't being fished by humans. Another one um, for the final mark, there's an abundant food. There is abundant food in the Atlantic. So there's lots of food, less competition. We talked about competition. I gave that as a clue. Um, so therefore, they've got lots and lots of food. OK, so I know that one was a bit tedious in some respects because we were just looking at lots of exam questions. Next time, I've got a nice video already made that I'm going to use in conjunction with the, the lesson video to look at quadrat sampling. So um, hopefully that will be quite a good one. Um, installation failed. Who knows what that means? All right, then. I hope you enjoy your day. I uh, hope you found that interesting and well done for giving the questions a go and getting your green pen done effectively. Well done. Thank you.